Hello and welcome back to Heads and Tails. I'm one of the Open and co-founders, Henry Faber, and I'm really, really pleased and excited to have Atif Hassan with us today from Duke's Education. Super inspiring story behind an educational business that I'm excited to hear more about. Little introduction on Atif. He founded Duke's Education, which is now one of Europe's largest education providers. Global very soon, no doubt, in 2015. He's also chairman of Cavendish Education, which is a group of 11 schools for pupils with dyslexia and autism, and a trustee of St. James Independent Schools, I believe. You'll have to tell us if any of that's out of date. Atif's also on the board of Crested, which sounds like an amazing organization, the Council for the Registration of Schools Teaching Dyslexic Pupils. There's definitely a theme here. Atif has a first-class degree in maths and economics and also experience with the British Army, which I'm hoping we'll hear a little bit about. In 2020, he was awarded the Freedom of the City of London for services to education. You are a well-known figure, and we are very grateful to have you with us. So thank you. No, thank you, Henry. It's um, great to be here. Looking forward to it. You know we're obsessed with all things mentoring. I've bored you about it lots before. Mentoring is our DNA and lifeblood here at Opperden. Did you have a mentor? Do you have a mentor now? Any any perspective or stories on mentoring you're happy to share? Well, firstly, can I say what you're doing is very cool and very dear to me. And I think what you and Walter have created is very special. And I am sure, like I was inspired by mentors, and I will come to that, uh, you're inspiring many, many children and young people uh, in the same way. Um, I've been blessed throughout my life by a whole range of people, uh, which we can loosely call mentors. Um, I've had two formal professional coaches um, in Humphrey Walters, who was the coach to the England rugby team in 2003 when we won the World Cup. And right now I'm uh, being coached by a chap called Dr. David Priestley, a behavioral psychologist, uh, super cool, and helping me becoming the best version of myself. But informally, um, I've got a team around the team and a group of people. And I know it sounds tough, but make me look good. And, um, you know, and mentoring is something that you have to kind of crave. You have to kind of absorb and take. And I've really loved learning um, throughout. And I've taken informally from things from my father. I really learned the, the notion of gratitude and service. Uh, from my sister, the importance of family, from my partner, holds me to account on nutrition, well-being and health, um, as well as gives a lot of, and receives a lot of love. Uh, to my two best friends who I see every week, who keep me real, authentic and vulnerable. Um, to my headmaster, to my officer commanding when I joined the Army Cadets at the age of 13, who taught me really probably the most about hard work and leading from the front. Um, to uh, a whole raft of people that I've experienced in the business world. But if I had to pick one uh, poignant moment or where mentoring really was um, transformational, it was probably when I transitioned from the city um, to the world of education, um, which has been incredibly fruitful, inspiring. And that moment in time when you're in a lucrative role and you've spent the best part of a decade in a particular industry, it's incredibly daunting to just give up everything and immerse yourself in, immerse yourself in the world of education and really start from the floor. And there's an individual called Jeremy Sinclair, who was the founder and chairman of MNC Saatchi, an ad agency, and actually the chair of trustees of St. James. And that's where I got to know him working on a charity together. And his uh, philosophical approach, wisdom, support, and incredibly generous um, time um, was really tangible at a moment of inflection. And I can really point to the moment where he got about as close to ordering me to do it uh, as he could. But uh, from him, I learned actually the notion of leading from behind. And that's something I've taken right into both Cavendish and Dukes. Um, so really believe in it. think we should roll it out uh, uh, more widely. I hope you do really well in what you're doing. Thank you. We're definitely trying. We're trying in a few Duke schools already. So, you know, the, the, the beginnings are there. The beginnings are there. Um, perhaps we can go back even further. Teenage Atif, maybe even younger. Oh, no. Maybe there's an oh, no. anecdote from school. Oh, no. What were you like? Were you did good reports? You know, maybe there's a little flavor of how the, how the, the younger you has affected the older you. Well, school was interesting. Um, as someone severely dyslexic and what would, today you'd call ADHD, back then 
naughty boy syndrome. Uh, I was misunderstood, lost. But um, state school was profitable because I set up my first business selling sweets in the playground. Um, so I was probably one of the richest 13-year-olds uh, knocking around. But I uh, got myself into too much trouble and uh, was on the headmaster's naughty step too many times and was effectively asked to leave. Um, so I must be probably the only chair of governors who's been uh, thrown out of a school uh, and somewhat ironic what I'm doing now. But I, I found myself at a lovely, small, nurturing, independent school who really sort of were able to find those sort of genius elements from within and really nurture them and play to my strengths and support my weaknesses. And um, somewhat ironic because um, the school was at the time based in Eccleston Square in Victoria and then later moved to Popesville and Crossdeep in Twickenham. And if you know a little about Dukes, um, Eaton Square Prep is now based in Eccleston Square. And in the same building where now my daughter is at Radnor Senior um, is a Duke school. And so I actually own um the settings uh where i was actually schooled so um life goes full circle there can't be many of those out there there just can't be that's such a that's such a lovely anecdote i'm sure it's not been plain sailing all the time what's been toughest and yeah that could be pre or post jukes but yeah i'll leave that with you yeah look i think starting uh the organization was clearly tough um big decisions remortgaging home um, cutting income, selling a lot of things to make it happen. I think COVID was really tough. Um, keeping um, SEN schools open, EYFS centres open whilst the country was being told to close down and the financial hit of giving big discounts to families and looking after and fully paying our staff and not uh, going through redundancy programmes was financially probably the most challenging period of my life. But by some distance, I would say um, dealing with severe safeguarding instances, um, we report every week on a Friday and a Saturday morning are typically spent uh, reading uh, uh, individual situations and trend data and individual uh, circumstances is can be uh, incredibly depressing. And it's, uh, it's uh, perhaps a sad reality of the world we live in. But with 20,000 children, the cross section of what we see uh, can be quite daunting and something from the early days um i was at one of the schools and had to deliver first aid to a young girl who attempted to take her own life and um uh, you i can't talk too much about the details as you'd expect uh, but having sort of dealt with the situation got her into an ambulance and done the paperwork i remember driving home that evening and just crying and crying and crying and just thinking, I'm not a social worker. What am I doing? I'm completely out of my depth. Real that real notion of imposter syndrome. And um, and then a few years later, um, you know, I had to tell a six year old boy um, that his um, mother passed away uh, that morning. And as someone whose uh, mother had passed away at six years old, I, I knew firsthand from my own experiences um, how difficult and I almost projected my own vulnerability and situation in that thing and, uh, and all the thoughts were going through and all the emotions what I felt at that moment in time, everything from my mum's funeral to experiencing that uh, a real deep loss. And um, it's incredibly challenging. It's very real and um, from uh, real life situations. And, you know, it's a huge privilege and it's thoroughly enjoyable. I absolutely love my job. It's the best job in the world. But um, really human situations. And I just can't thank teachers across the nation, across the globe for what they do day in, day out and looking after young people and really saving lives and in, and making lives. And um, I've had some experience of it now, um, but... Yeah, it's very simple to answer that question. The safeguarding mm. is the most difficult part of the job. It's so interesting because I think so many people listening to this would really empathize with that. That's not an answer we've had before. So thank you. Very, an, a very honest appraisal and a real example, I think, of all that glitters is not not necessarily gold. And I think fascinating to know your your. now I can picture you on a Saturday morning. Oof. I try and be on the golf course on a Saturday morning. You're, you're, you're putting the rest of us to shame. So. Uh, I don't have time for you. No, thank you for thank you for sharing. And maybe in brief, a, a nice peek. Something that's been a has there been some great moment of catharsis or a, a, a yeah an Everest that you feel has been climbed. 
Henry, honestly, um, every day is just uh, wonderful. I, I truly am blessed to be doing something I really love. I get out of bed and really excited. I'm first in, last out. And um, there's a genuine passion. of. I've, to me, I found my calling um, in working with young people. I try and get in the classroom as much as possible. And um, in, the, in the very first school, probably... Um, Gretton, which was a scruffy 28 children school in Cambridge, um, near past from a regulatory perspective. And today is a school thriving with 200 children, totally full, lost and outstanding. But just working with those young people, um, you know, it was uh, in the early days when I was trying to do every job in the school from almost the caretaker to building manager to bursa to marketing to teaching football and rugby to these young people. Um, I have to say they were some of my highlights and I remember actually getting the keys on the very first day of completion and standing outside the gates and uh, I don't want to sort of sound like a crybaby because it's not uh, uh, an often occurrence for me but I, that was another moment where I generally cried, cried with disbelief that wow uh, this is something I'm going to be part of, something I'm going to now shape and I've done it and um, I'd say that that was a moment of truly uh, extraordinary Everest moment as you call it the second was probably earlier this year where we launched um, and with our scale across both Cavendish and Dukes and Dukes in particular, we were able to launch our own foundation and, you know, a lot of organizations have them. But this was to create the biggest uh, endowment fund uh, for transformational bursaries for children in our schools. And we're attempting to raise £100 million, uh, which is not a small sum, and will really make the, the lives of lots of disadvantaged children um, uh, meaningfully change. And uh, very excited that we're going to do that. And the charity set up, team appointed, and the uh, work starts now. But it really, really felt, wow, this is something that could really make a difference. Yeah, on a micro scale, I can really empathise with Oppidum Foundation. It's a, it's a really, they don't make it easy to set up charities in this country. Complex thing, you know. Everyone, you think you're trying to do good, but it's difficult, really difficult. Um, that's an amazing, amazing thing to be aiming at. I'm excited to see that playing up. Content. Uh, are you a reader? Are you a watcher? Do you listen where there is time? How are you unwinding? And, and what can you recommend for us? You know, actually, someone who really didn't read a novel uh, till the age of 30, um, my own dyslexia, it was, really, it was really about fear. So now what I do, I look at books and I scan the sentence and I sort of absorb it. Um, but I've actually developed the love of reading. And um, so I do listen to podcasts and I do watch uh, things, but actually I probably uh, read more than I watch TV Um and but I'm catching up, so I'm catching up all the books that you would have read as a child, um, and many uh, people would have done in their uh, early uh, adulthood. And so I've spent a lot of time now reading. And as part of my morning routine, I wake up, I pray, I meditate, I do some exercise, but I always try and read something every day as well. And um, so I'm I'm a, I'm a reader. Um, yeah, and are you see. going? Are you going fiction for kind of getting away? Is it escapism, or are you constantly trying to upskill and learn, and you know, furiously onto the next idea? Yeah, it's mostly, it's 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 not necessarily fiction uh, most of the time. So I'm at the moment fascinated by uh, the notion of sort of centennial companies, um, and uh, read a really uh, interesting book called Legacy by a uh, big rugby fan, so a guy called James Kerr, uh, which is actually a story about the All Blacks. But uh, Centennial Company, the companies which have been around for 100 years, but been at the top of their game and real longevity, sustainability. So it's not about the next two years, three years, or the short term sort of profit targets that uh, a lot of organizations have to sit with. And what uh, Centennial Companies have attributes of is real stability, but also disruption, stability of leadership, stability of purpose, stability of vision, but also the ability to kind of really recognize that they, they need to reinvent themselves. And this book um, really sort of looks at the all-black story, um, and there's a few anecdotes from it. There's one, the notion they call uh, one of the chapters is sweeping the sheds, where no one is too proud uh, to literally uh, get involved in cleaning the changing rooms. And that humility in running an organization uh, is really powerful and really tangible. Uh, so pleased you have voiced one of Opperden's five core values, sweep the sheds. We used to Sorry. say sweep, sweep the tents when we had summer camps, but now we no longer run a summer camp. We just say sweep the sheds. We stole it from the All Blacks too, but absolutely. And it's funny, 
we've got today, we've got the Association for Character Education here doing a, an inspection of our kind of character provision. And the first thing they said about Sweep the Sheds was, this seems like a focus on humility as a virtue. Yeah. And you you hit the nail on the head. So that's twice in one day it's been mentioned. <laughs> Very serendipitous. Um, maybe there's an unpopular or controversial opinion along the way that you're happy to stand up behind. I mean, education is as split as it's ever been and probably becoming more so, but maybe something you'd be happy to voice and stand up behind. Yeah, actually, probably lots. Um, and I'm quite sort of free and bold in uh, giving our opinions on things. I mean, I'd probably eliminate the 11 plus and or at least create a UCAS system where there's a single exam for that. Uh, I'll join you on that. Very happy I would, to, yeah, I would really encourage children to play more. Um, I'm not sure the notion of homework for the early years is particularly good. Maybe home play and project-based learning. But, um, you know, I think... Um, the sector is going through a lot of media coverage, particularly around Labour Party policy about the introduction of VAT. And I think it's an unfortunate uh, policy, but also think it's an unfortunate narrative, which is creating unfortunate divide between state and independent. And um, if you look at other um, public sector utilities and uh, services, much more integration between the private sector has been beneficial. And we look at healthcare, uh, whilst you might walk into an NHS hospital from the time you walk in from the cleaning contractors to the uh, MRI machines to uh, a lot of the uh, services have now been outsourced um, to uh, and lots of other industries with mixed success. But um, I really believe that rather than sort of creating further divide, actually, if the state and independent sector were to come together and use private sector capital, uh, a combination of using the spare capacity in independent schools rather than taxing it, uh, it would actually uplift society and um, really help uh, state schools. And so um, the reintroduction of assisted places, but also incentivizing uh, independent schools to take more uh, children who are means tested and disadvantaged children, uh, I really believe would take away the burden on um, uh, state schools. And then finally, I actually think if that economic model worked, uh, which I really do, and I'm happy uh, another day to go through the numbers on it, I actually think we could pay our teachers more. And and that's will be magical because these are um, sort of the earth individuals and humans who put their um, careers on the line to look after uh, our most important commodities in our children. And as a nation, um, we could just do so much more for them. And I just think the system is broken. The economic system is broken uh, to not enable them to pay more. How are we going to force through that battle between ideological polarization? It's, it's, it's messy, isn't it? It feels like I, I love everything you said. It's hard to it's hard to feel totally optimistic that that can happen in the near term. But maybe you can help push that along. Yeah, um, which. We're trying. We're, we're, we've met with actually all three um, political main, major political parties, and it's a narrative uh, that we're pushing. Uh, and all we need is greater dialogue. And um, you know, you, you talk about character education and it, just that uh, aspect of humility, but also respect and listening and authenticity and the ability to keep learning. Uh, Henry, you know all too well. But uh, if we could actually get that amongst politicians uh, rather than political party scoring. Uh, we'll we'll make some headway. Yeah. Okay. Right with you on that. Um, finally, maybe a piece of advice for those in the sector. And I say the sector because it's not just teachers. It could be educationalists or those in private sector, but working with education. Maybe a piece of advice that could carry, has carried you along and might carry along others. Yeah, I think when I was growing up, um, it was this notion of IQ was really important. We were kind of measured by how clever we were in our class. We had form order, there were rankings, and almost society um, sort of judged us by how bright we were. And then we really understood the notion of EQ, emotional intelligence, um, and became of greater importance almost than IQ itself. COVID came along and we learned the value of uh, the social quotient, SQ. Um, we needed human interaction. We needed contact. We needed warmth and uh, connectivity uh, beyond screens. And uh, so we kind of learned this real importance of something which uh, we sort of realized but didn't really appreciate. And I remember pre-COVID people talking about schools are going to be eliminated. Well, you know, the one thing that we really missed was schooling. 
But then roll forward, you know, we all had to bounce back from the pandemic and um, what a resilient country and world we live in because, we, you know, we did. And it's scary to think it was four years ago now and, you know, uh, incredible times. But this notion of BQ and, you know, we, we need to really um, teach young people the ability to bounce uh, back because life is never going to go in a straight line. Mine hasn't. Uh, everything from um, losing my eldest son to my mum passing away to being in car accidents to being uh, in crisis situations, I, I can point to a whole series of crisis events. And our ability to bounce back is something we're trying to really drive amongst young people and that, that resilience and real inner core and somewhere to go to and uh, really find your inner values to uh, uh, find that strength to come back from. And we know actually your BQ is probably now more important than any of those. But even more than that now, um, you know, if you look at the papers about organizations and even teaching, uh, I would probably label something called LQ, which uh, um, the marketeers would call it a love quotient. I would sort of say it's the legacy quotient. And the legacy quotient is thinking about your career in terms of the legacy you're going to leave, what impact you want to have on the world. And certainly I wake up and ask myself that question, um, having survived near-death situations and really gone to the brink of uh, being here or not being here. I really think, what am I here for? And what are the what impact is Duke's going to have? What impact is Cavendish going to have? And what impact am I going to have in supporting my team, um, in supporting young people? And I think people um, starting off in their careers or even halfway through their careers really want to think about, right, I'm going to go into this new role. What can I leave behind um, in the memory that's going to be really meaningful? And I think if you think like that, you're going to make better long-term and decisions which are for the wider organizations and for the better for society and better for the organization and perhaps even for your family than for yourself and it's really detaching yourself from ego and making real soulful decisions um and if you can do that you'll focus on this word which has been overused perhaps purpose uh day in day out a, a lovely and very eloquent way to end thank you very much a, a wide-ranging and yeah, really well put together conversation or certainly on your side. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you sharing the time. Look forward to watching where Jukes goes next. And um, yeah, thank you for thank you for spending the time. Henry, thanks for having me.